my name is Brian Bellamizar. Uh, I'm pursuing my PhD at Western University under the supervision of Dr. Gerard Pratt and Dr. Mostafa and Isabeth. Uh, so I don't know if, if, if Gerard wants to, to make an introduction, Gerard. Just very briefly, hello everyone. This is uh, uh, the contribution from the University of Western Ontario to this uh, fascinating project. And uh, Brian's been with us for a couple of years and he's taken this waveform inversion process and uh, worked with it very successfully uh, with this uh, larger lake data set. He's got a couple of other data sets on the go as well, which we'll see later, but uh, today he's gonna be telling you very specifically about larger lake. And I think uh, the images will speak for themselves. So uh, uh, I'll, I, I'll shut up and let Brian take over. Thank you, Gera. Uh, so I will be talking a little bit about part of the of the work that have, we have been doing uh, on structural imaging uh, using 2D and 2.5D wafer inversion, and also azimuthal binning in, in, in the, with the Larder Lake data set. Uh, just one second here. Okay. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm pursuing my PhD at Western University. Uh, I'm Venezuelan. Um, I did my bachelor's degree in Venezuela. And then I did my master's degree in geophysics uh, in Beijing, China. And I've been in, in, at Western University since 2018. And the project is, is uh, funded partially by the ENSER. And also we see all these logos here that are uh, collaborating in, the, in funding the, the project. Um, I'd like to start by uh, showing uh, this image here. It's, it's basically a, 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 brief, a very brief preview of the last image in my, in my presentation. Well, what we have here, this is a post-stack migrated uh, image. This is in Lardo Lake. And uh, this image is about nine kilometers depth. We have the time access here. Uh, this is the Lardo Lake uh, transect. Uh, and we also have the, the geological map here. I just want to say, okay. Um, so one of the points that I want to, to start with is just uh, by saying that superficial ore deposits are, of course, being uh, depleted. And uh, this drives the uh, mining industry towards deeper uh, exploration of mineral endowments. However, as you can see in this image, one second, it represents about three kilometers into the subsurface. So that's what I call near surface, uh, the first three kilometers. And you can see that uh, most of the analysis of reflection data is, is based on rather a regional scale. As, as you can see, we have plenty of knowledge of what's happening in terms of structural behavior at depth, uh, but we are not sure what's happening in the near surface, uh, about three kilometers from the subsurface. And you can see that uh, in this section, is very little information there. So one of the, of the points of my work is uh, it's addressing that uh, pressing need for filling the gap between what we know from surface geology, surface perspective, and what we know from a uh, crustal scale seismic section. So I'm gonna uh, go back, revisit this image later on. Um, there are two techniques, as I mentioned, that we're gonna be uh, using in this study. Uh, one is full waveform inversion uh, to image the velocity structure of the first three kilometers here, 2.5 kilometers, so the near surface. So we have a better connection between surface geology and the seismic section. And also we'll be implementing azimuthal binning to improve energy focusing and, and signal alignment um, at that. So I'd like to start uh, by showing, I know you are familiar with this image already. Uh, we have the Larder Lake Transect here in blue, which is uh, overlain by um, a local geological map. Uh, they make, one of the main structures in the area is the Larder Lake Cadillac Deformation Zone that we have here and also the Lincoln NPC shear zone. Uh, the transect, of course, is located in Northeastern Ontario. And you can see the transect is actually deviated about 2.7 kilometers west and 2.5 kilometers east from a vertical or a straight path, which means that the profile is, is very crooked, it suffers from severe crookedness. Um, this poses uh, challenges when it comes to imaging in, 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 in this environment, not only do, again, because of the crookedness of the profile, but because of the uh, challenges of hard rock. We will have the, the contribution of out of plane uh, energy components that are difficult to deal with. And in fact, the, the, the best approach to deal with these components is to perform a 3D viscoelastic uh, modeling, which basically takes into account 
um, energy losses and the different type of seismic phases that we encounter in, in observed data. But of course, this is uh, computationally too expensive, it's too prohibitive to, to perform. Uh, so in this project, we are left with the, the implementation of 2D, uh, a 2D approach and a 2.5D approach. So um, one of the main difference between these uh, modeling uh, techniques is that it, under the 2.5D approach, although it is much more computationally expensive than the 2D approach, we will be taking into account the crookedness of the profile by computing, computing those wave numbers uh, components on the, on the side of the, of the crooked profile. In a 2D approach, we won't be able to do that as uh, we will be working on a, on a 2D plane. So that, that, that will not take into account the crookedness of this uh, severely uh, crooked geometry. Um, I'd like to move on and show you what the real data looks like. Uh, this is the, the type of data that we are using. Uh, we have a shot gather here. Uh, this is offset in the horizontal axis, which is distance between sources and source and receiver. Uh, on the, in the vertical axis, we have time. You can see that this is a, a beautiful uh, gather. It's one of the uh, exceptionally good vibrosase gathers that we have uh, in, in Lardo Lake. Um, most of the gather has, signal, has excellent signal to noise ratio, uh, up to eight kilometers. So you can see in this good gather, we have up to 17 kilometers. There are different seismic phases that can be uh, easily recognizable, such as we have a refraction here. We have elastic modes appearing there, surface wave. Uh, we also have very complex, uh, I didn't mention it, uh, tag it, but we do have some complex uh, contribution of what it might be uh, diffractions in, the, in, in this area, as we can see these complex uh, seismic phases arriving here. I'm gonna touch on that later on. Um, one of the, of, the, of the arrival that is very difficult to see, which is not uncommon in crystalline environments, are reflections. That's why I use this sign here. Um, this might be a, a, reflect, a reflected signal, but at this stage, we are, not, we are not sure. So this is the type of, of data set that we are working with in Lander Lake. I'd like to jump immediately into the first part of the, of the talk, which is full waveform inversion, uh, or FWI. Basically, FWI is a nonlinear inverse technique that generates quantitative models of the subsurface. And uh, in order to do that, the first thing that we, that we uh, do is we find the best geological model that explain our field data, our observed data. In this case, we are working with velocity. So we use that initial velocity model to compute th synthetic data and, and then uh, calculate the differences between synthetic and observed data. And that difference is then minimized by updating the underlying parameter model, which in this case is, is, is velocity. And uh, that is done by, um, can be done by several op optimization methods. Uh, we use local uh, methods, uh, steepest descent. And this technique has been, um, it was in, uh, introduced by Leilian Tarantola in 1983 and 1984 respectively. But it wasn't until the, uh, the work of Pratt 1999 that this technique became practical. Uh, the technique nowadays is being uh, almost standardized in the, in the oil and gas industry. You can find plenty of literature uh, in sedimentary environments, especially offshore data set. Uh, but when it comes uh, to uh, crystalline environments, you will find less literature uh, just because of uh, the inherent challenges of, uh, of uh, full waveform inversion in hard rock settings. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, this is, what, this is the first FWI implementation in the Superior Province in, in Canada. Now, um, I mentioned that we are going to be applying a 2D and 2.5D. So I just like to draw some uh, very uh, brief uh, features or, or, or features about, uh, about what the difference are. So in, in a 2D approach, um, we will have to project all the, the, the sources and receivers, so all the, the stations onto a, a 2D plane in order to, to perform 2D uh, modeling. And that's what we do here. So we have the original geometry, as you can see it in blue here. And what we do is we project that onto uh, a 2D line, a 2D plane. And uh, this can be actually better visualized by this, by this image here. We have sources on the horizontal axis 
and we have receivers on the vertical axis. You can think of, it, of this as a, as a, a stacking chart. Um, you see the white areas here are areas without data and the black areas here are area, areas with data. So we, we want to preserve this, this, data, this area here that contains data. Uh, under a 2D approach and because of the projection, we actually will have to remove some data to uh, guarantee that the inversion won't be contaminated by travel time errors due to the, to the projection. So if you, if you see here, I'm gonna show you now the data that is discarded, that is rejected. So you can see these data, these blank spaces is actual data that has been rejected due to the uh, projection. Uh, it turns out to be about 13% of the, of the total data. Uh, so it's, it, it might be quite a bit in some cases, depending on the crookedness of the profile. And this is why we decided to uh, um, take on the two and a half D approach, although it is computationally more expensive. Uh, I, I won't go into detail because of time constraints, uh, but again, I will show you this is 2D. We have to reject this data and I, I will show you two and a half D. We don't have to reject any data. Okay. So um, this uh, here is the initial model, the best geological fit. Uh, as I was mentioning a, a moment ago, we, we found the best representation, initial representation of what uh, the velocity structure or velocity variations looks like in the area. Uh, one of the main uh, features that you can uh, see is uh, this shadow area. It represents a, a region in which uh, it is low confidence. It means uh, that we don't trust the area below 800 meters. And this is one of the main uh, limitations of, uh, this, of travel time tomography. We use 3D travel time tomography to obtain this velocity model. And although it's very difficult, it's almost impossible to draw any structural interpretation from this uh, velocity image. We can, we can see, I don't know if, you, if it is possible in your screens, but there, there is a low velocity area associated uh, to this area here that is under the Lincoln Nipissi shear zone or coincident. And we also see like a, a, a higher um, velocity domain uh, north the Lambda Lake Cadillac deformation zone than uh, to the south. Uh, but that's uh, it's, it's going to be to be seen in the in the velocity model that, we, that I will show regarding FWI. Now, uh, before implementing FWI, uh, there are several steps that needs to be done. Uh, specifically, we need to to make sure that our field data, the recorded data, uh, fit the mathematical approximation that we are using. Uh, in this case, we're working in a acoustic and isotropic. Uh, approximation, which means that there are several uh, seismic phases that need to, to be addressed uh, in, in, in order to fit our data to our mathematical or our uh, scientific theory. I won't go into detail into these processes, uh, but there are uh, several processes that need to be implemented so uh, FWI is uh, successful. I'm going to show you now, uh, this is here is the result. Um, because of time constraints, of course, I have to, um, I, I, ca I cannot show the intermediate steps, but the main uh, result here is that we have the initial velocity model, okay, uh, where it's very difficult to draw any structural interpretation. And then we have the 2D uh, model that recall that it doesn't consider um, the uh, crookedness of the profile. And then we have the 2.5D model. Uh, one of the main points of FWI is that we can directly perform quantitative interpretation on the image uh, in terms of, of, of velocity variations or in, in terms of, of the velocity structure representing uh, what the, the, the actual structures are in the subsurface. Uh, we see that we have uh, up to depth about 2.3 kilometers and uh, it's, it's easily uh, we can easily see that the two and a half D model has much more uh, finer details than the two D model. Uh, model. Uh, one of the main uh, points is that uh, overall they represent uh, the velocity domain. So we have a low velocity domain here, and we have a, a certain uh, deep associated to it, and we also have a low velocity in the two D model, uh, as well as in this area, and um, this area which correlates more or less to the area of the Misema Misfit uh, fault. Um, 
I have also included in only in the two and a half D model this uh, line here that uh, represents a, a, a velocity counter that separates what I interpreted as uh, as sedimentary material or less competent volcanic rocks from the the, the more competent volcanic successions uh, at that. Uh, it, it, it remains to be discussed with uh, the geologists of the of the of the project to to make sense of it uh, with a geological map. But I will be uh, showing a little bit that in a minute. Uh, so this is what we obtain from full waveform inversion. And again, we I will superimpose it later on with the with the geology. But we definitely see there are different domains and they correlate with what we will expect uh, from the, the information we have on surface geology. Now, I'd like to mention uh, a little bit about uh, azimuth albini. This is the second part uh, of, the, of, the, of the talk. Um, basically, what you're looking at here, this is the actual uh, geometry of Lardo Lake. We have the processing line here. And what you see here, this dark area, is basically uh, a, a common midpoint a cloud, which represents the scattering of reflection points due to the crookedness of the profile. Now, uh, in, in crooked geometries like Lardo Lake, um, it's very difficult uh, it, the imaging because, again, because of the um, uh, cross deep effects that, that will be uh, recorded as well. In fact, if uh, in, in, in order to, to image deep in events, such as the one that we're looking at here, let's just pretend this is a, re a reflector sheet that is deep in south and striking west east. In order to better image this structure, we will need to uh, perform deep shooting, which means that we need to shoot uh, perpendicular to the uh, strike of the structure. But in, in severely crooked profile, that's a condition that is not met because uh, locally the, um, the, the line will be oblique to the dominant uh, strike of the area. And to complicate this uh, a scenario, we have that in 2D profiling and processing, we assume that uh, all of the energy that returns to the sensors come back from within the vertical plane beneath the processing line, which is not true because we know that uh, geology, the geology of the area is, is three-dimensional by nature. So that means, again, that we will be recording a cross-deep cross deep, uh, energy that will degrade the quality of the, of the, of the stack and the migrated image. So, one of the uh, solution or the proposal will be to uh, optimize the direction of the of the beams in accordance to local geology. And we can see here, this is a very basic um, uh, a scheme. We have the in dashed red line that will be the processing line. And we have in, in blue, the standard beam, which is always perpendicular to the processing line. And the strategy will be finding a, a, a uh, an optimum direction that is in accordance with local uh, strike, as we can see in the red uh, bean here, which will uh, which will be uh, which will decrease the contribution of cross deep effects and improve energy focusing in the image. I will be uh, showing an example. Uh, this is around uh, the southern part of Florida Lake. Uh, this map we have here: Lincoln Nipissing Shear Zone. Uh, as a yellow dashed line, and we have as an orange orange dashed line the processing uh, line. It's a little bit exaggerated, uh, but it represents the, the the processing line, and the blue line represents the actual uh, geometry of the lake. So if we look at this area, uh, we we actually are working with one of the most complex parts of the lake. Uh, not only because we have severe crookedness in the geometry of the acquisition, but also because local geology actually um, it changes a strike from west-northwest uh, towards east-west uh, around the um, Lander Lake Cadillac deformation zone that is about this area here, not shown. So um, one of the points that I want to draw from this image is that the, the standard bean here will be a, this small black bean a, a striking north 60 east. Uh, however, we find we found that the best optim the optimum uh, beaming is this uh, east-west red bean here. Now, by doing so, I can show you some of the of, of the improvement. 
So this is a, a, a section with five CMP gathers. So they, they are centered at this uh, distance along the X axis. And we can see one of the things that we can see is these reflections uh, here are, uh, they have a curvature associated to them, uh, which of course means that when we are uh, uh, implementing the stacking process, we will be, in, we will be causing amplitude smearing just because the signal is, is ill aligned. Uh, and that's one of the, of the improvement that we want to add with azimuthal binning. We have inconventional binning here. We want to make sure that the energy is better focused. And I'm gonna show now the uh, uh, optimized. So on the optimized binning, you can see that that curve to have been corrected. And we see that the, um, the, the reflections are, are much more um, focused or better focused. I'm gonna go back and show you conventional. This is the conventional one. And then I'm gonna go uh, forward and show you the optimized binning. You can, you, you can see this. Now, when this is done along the entire 42 kilometers length of the profile, we will find a, a better signal uh, alignment. One of the things that I wanted to mention as well from here is that it's very difficult to see actual reflections. And again, that's not uncommon from uh, coming from crystalline environment. Um, now, I, I like to go back to a more um, descriptive area. This is the same area. Uh, this is a post-stack migrated section that was migrated by an external contractor. It was under contract by Metal Earth. Uh, again, this is post-stack. And I just wanted to show to compare what conventional versus um, azimuthal binning can do. So we have this area here is uh, a zoom that I show here. Basically, we don't, we don't see a, much information here. We do see there is a, a kind of reflection package dipping north in this area, but it's very difficult to, to see it. Now, this is the in-house uh, processing. So this is the processing that we did, uh, that I, I did as part of the project. This is, again, same conventional binning. But even with, with conventional binning, we can see that the in-house processing has a higher uh, frequency content and um, it's more noticeable, these uh, reflections coming down uh, towards the south. And even in this area here, we can see, if we zoom in, we see a kind of uh, a reflection about 2.3 uh, kilometers that might be extended here, but it's very difficult to see the continuity of this event that uh, it's of importance because it's near the Lincoln Nipissin zone. Uh, so when, when I implement the uh, optimized binning, as you will see in a second, this is the optimized binning here, we see a much better coherent and, and the strength of the amplitude uh, it's, uh, of the arrival is, is, is much better. Brian, you've uh, got two minutes to wrap it up. Ooh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so one of the things we, we see this cross um, reflection here is actually being eliminated, which of course confirmed that a, it, it was simply a cross deep effect being a stacking phase. Okay. I had my, my time, it was wrong. Sorry about that. Uh, this is the final image, post-stack image, and uh, we see that most of the of the structure correlates with surface geology. And one of the main outputs is that with the velocity model that we have uh, developed with FWI, we can certainly uh, uh, correlate additional faults that has not been interpreted before, but they are they have support. They ha they have uh, a supporting base. Uh, at depth, but it's difficult to see whether they extrapolate towards the surface. But if we evaluate the velocity model, we see, for instance, in this area, it, it's basically it's a body of velocity, high velocity separating these two domains. And I might be related to the fact that we have these reflections coming up here and being uh, stopped. Uh, I'm so sorry about the time. Uh, I put my time uh, No worries. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Brian. Um, I got it. There's a couple of questions here in the chat room. Um, is there any reason why the legend goes to 9,000 meters per second? Is would, Wouldn't 7,700 red zones already be too high for such shallow depth? And then in brackets, there are any ultramafics here? Yes, there are a lot of ultramafics in the area, but maybe you can address the... Uh, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, I think in, in terms of, of a scale, it, it may be because if, if we look at the, at the image, uh, this is the, like the only area, like separate area there that we have uh, a very high velocity compared to the other part of the profile. Uh, I do agree that it, it looks like it's a little bit over to what we will expect in, in this environment. Uh, but it's certainly a, something that, that might be representing the, the state of the, of, of, the, of the geological body there. Uh, I, 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 I do agree with that because we were discussing that before, uh, but uh, I think it's still in the, in the realm of possibilities. Uh, we have a velocity probably about 7,500 there uh, meters per second. And the other, second, the, this, the other question about ultramafic, uh, and to be honest, I'm not really uh, familiar or too familiar with the, with, uh, the, the geological interpretation, which, in which case I actually had discussion with Kate uh, Robin, and I actually appreciate uh, the discussions. Uh, so basically the, 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 the end result uh, help us to, to interpret these, these two uh, structures that we have here. Okay, thank you. Um, your your, your cross-sections have a lot of vertical exaggeration on them. Uh, given that, aren't the faults displayed shallowly dipping, given that vertical exaggeration? Yeah, it, it will be, it will be the, the true um, dip will be a little bit uh, less than what is uh, shown here. Uh, for instance, we see one of the of the of the cases that I was hoping to be uh, steeper uh, is Lincoln Nipis injury zone. For instance, we can see it here. I calculated it was like about sixty five degrees um, when I put this in in one on one scale. Uh, but I also think that it might have to do with the 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 the, the strike of the profile when it hits the the. Uh, structure here is oblique, so we we might expect an uh, an upper end deep that is lower than than the actual the, the true deep. Okay. But we see, for instance, this area here associated to from uh, the Misema misfit. It showed the um, the low velocity anomaly that we will expect from from a, a shear zone, and it's 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 probably eighty five degrees here, for instance. Okay. It might be with. Yeah. All right, Brian, uh, was the amplitude also derived from the viscoacoustic work or was this assumed constant? The, 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 the amplitude. Yeah. Yeah, we, yeah. Uh, for full for inversion, we actually uh, work, first of all, the strategy was working with uh, only the phase information, the, the kinematics of the, of the wave field. Uh, but in later stages, we, we also included uh, the dynamic of the wave field uh, by by performing conventional uh, XWI. So the objective function included both phase and amplitude, yeah. Okay, excellent. And we have a last question here. How can optimal azimuth be determined for each bin? Yeah, that's a very uh, interesting question. Um, my research was based on, on, the, on the literature review of the area, uh, especially on the new reports in Metal Earth. Uh, so it's basically information from what we know from surface geology. So that was the starting point. Uh, and then after implementing that throughout the line, different intervals, like as I mentioned, at the, the most complicated part was towards the southern of the Larder Lake uh, here in this area because we see that in, in, in a span of uh, less than 10 kilometers, it changed from west-northwest to east-west. Um, but yeah, basically from, from, the, from the information that we have from surface geology. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your input today. Thank you.